Testing one. Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> so thank you, Howard and Lane, for doing this. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am particularly happy to be here with Joy McDowell, whose work I really admire and who's I've had the great pleasure to get to know uh, in her time with OPA on the board, and I'm sorry to see her go. We're just uh, retiring, not dying. <laughs> okay, let's keep doing this, all right? <laughs> we threatened to, to do a poem together, but with the conference going on and everything, we just didn't pull it together. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Almost. Almost. I like, believe me, I, I'm, I say that so I don't talk too loud. Don't fade away. I won't fade away. <laughs> First of all, I want to say, hey, James, how you doing? I'm good. Yay! In the face of everything that's been going on, I just want to say it's been a wonderful year in the garden. And I've been thankful for that. <clears throat> so, we are here for Moments Before Midnight, which is an anthology that uh, Emily Hill and Bob Hill put together, and I want to thank them for what they did. And the proceeds uh, from this go to support the ACLU. So I think we'll have copies. If we don't, I'll sell you mine at a reduced rate. No, it, at <laughs> twice the price. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, so I'm going to start with one of the three poems of mine that were in the anthology, but the rest of what I do will be newer poems from the last few months. And I've got maybe 22 minutes worth of stuff, and we'll go through some different things. So, This poem is called Armies of Armies and Generals. If flags were buried in lost graves, and from them bugles called no reveille. If the words of dead soldiers wrote history, and war held no memory past midnight's armistice, if conflict's profit was made bankrupt by honorable men, and weapons were reforged into lasting community, then old generals could tend to armies of grandchildren, and perhaps a golden rule for peace could be negotiated by widows and orphans. I'll do, I'll, I'll do, um, I'll do a few of the political poems which can tend to be a little on the darker side, and then I'll change up the pace a little bit. This is a four line poem called American Facade. How long can a mask endure and overlook a dream derailed to preach a gospel so impure with negligence so thinly veiled? when they send the trucks. We will escape by the back door of night. We will take the old forest roads, the ones the loggers drove, when the trees were green, before the endless fires of these smoke-filled skies. We will escape by the back door of night when we're alerted, they breached the bridge where our children on the rope swing swung before the water was diverted to cool the great machine. We will escape by the back door of night when we watch the dust rise on the switchbacks as the trucks ascend and we hold each other as we did when we were free before the coup. We will escape by the back door of night, having watched our last sunrise, having spoken our love for each other, 
having read our final poems the way we did before they were crimes. We will escape by the back door of night when the first gunshots of resistance are heard, but before the missiles hit the meadows, when we climb the ridge lines, waving our white flags, and we flee into the ice caves of yesterday's better dreams. Catacomb days. We are laying the bones of our future beneath these streets. They will rest in the dry air forever. In the turmoil above, in the struggle to survive, we are spreading the ashes of the poor as a sediment we will lay upon in our own time. Our mother, the unforgiving earth, will push up new mountains with golden peaks, where we, in our riches, will rest as a layer of dust. Recent events have once again highlighted the obvious that we have a problem with the patriarchy of power in this country. It's also obvious that it will take a large majority of the country led by brave women to bring about a shift. I grew up in New England, and this poem looks backward at another time from my experience of America. D.A.R., of course, is the Daughters of the American Revolution. This is called American Consolation Prize. If force was a choice, she'd give herself permission to use it. Over a doormat of small desires, the restless wives with children living as ghosts in lost cities place in vases silk roses and paper carnations, watered with tears while making white lists of a conjure of cosmetics sold over opulent counters by slight younger women. At the four flagged corners of town, uniform guards in golf carts post the property color palette of predefined dreams at security gates opening slowly or not at all for Hispanic gardeners wearing bulletproof vests pledging fealty to a whitewashed Jesus and a weed-free landscape. At the members-only pool, she parks her husband's accomplishments and searches for the club key in the console's contraband of unfamiliar earrings and unopened condoms. Sitting at the shallow end of the bar, she orders her first consolation. She reads a collected fiction of American doctrine unimproved since Eisenhower. She slurs quotes at the black bartender she imagines are as indelible as her daughter's D.A.R. tattoo. Her purse falls, its contents sprawl, prescription vials, mace, and a handgun. She palms pink pills and orders another drink. Not even a dove landing on a flagpole gives her reason to reconsider. Okay, that's the dark stuff. We're done with that. And I can de delve into lighter fail, fair, but it does come at a price for both of us. I regret to make you aware of this new book recently put together by my friend Joshua Mertz. It's called The Book of the Blue Squid. It is a collection of blue limericks themed around cephalopods. Oh. Nothing unusual about that. It is alleged that I wrote some of them 
an accusation I vehemently deny. They are a dubious quality with no redeeming value. Somehow Joshua got my signature on a contract requiring me to read from it at public events I attend. <laughs> this is the reason I'm rarely invited to nice places. <laughs> if human and squid interbred, <laughs> we'd hope for the best, it is said. We'd have multiple genitals between pairs of tentacles and be tied up in knots in our beds. It only gets worse from there. One more, one more. One more, one more. One more. Get worse. It gets worse. It gets really worse. Oh my God, now you're in. Okay, this is the first one. You asked for it. Betty Sue took a big squid to bed, amazed at its skill-giving head. By tentacled spasms, she had several orgasms, and nothing between them was said. That's it. That's it. Okay, so if you write... If you write poetry, I'm sure you've been sidetracked in a dictionary or a synonym finder when you're looking for one word and you're drawn into the sound or the meaning of another word. So I was looking at some GRU word and it quickly became apparent how limited my vocabulary was in this column of words. And I knew, noticed that they all drew from kind of the same Latin root. So there was a similarity to their meetings, and I began to write some of them down. And um, it's from that list that I came up with this little ditty. So grunion, as you probably know, are a small fish. When the grunion run, how our horns will grump it, and our grilly gaily march, on full moons when the grunion come grumly on the grus. Oh, how the tide will grunstain with all of their desires while we lust with Miss Grundy and roast them on her fires. <laughs> okay, so we're going to put the political and the silly, as silly aside, and the next several poems come from my interest in religious and philosophical systems of thought, particularly the contrast between Buddhism and Christianity. I think these are at the heart of something I am experiencing personally, and perhaps what we are experiencing culturally as we figure out how to survive as a single collected humanity. So these poems take a different tone. <clears throat> On a trip to buy salt. An old man in a wooden boat sailed a large ocean under a hot sun. He drank his last water from a bamboo cup. Then dark clouds covered the bright sky. Winds blew, waves rose, rain fell until the storm passed. When the waters calmed, the old man found his cup was full, but the storm had returned him home. He slept that night on a bamboo mat by a mountain stream with a faint taste of salt on his lips. This was inspired by a poem written by a post-World War II Japanese feminist poet, and the epigraph is hers. Um, it's called The Destiny of Rhodes. Epigraph. If you try to explain the odd fact rationally, you must 
little by little, warp, then bend the flat land, much like you are bending the arms and legs of God. Tada Chimaco. <clears throat> Destiny of Rhodes. There once was a man who wept as he came to a fork in a road. When he forced himself to go both ways, becoming two men. On one road he traveled east, on the other road he traveled west, until at the end of his life, because the world is round, at that fork in the road he became one man again and wept. And though he had walked the world round and lived the lives of two men, he could not say why his heart shed tears of loss breaking into two hearts or shed tears of joy becoming one again. He could not say if the journey of two men was not the journey of a single heart, or the two roads, but one road, and the ending, but the start. In the last several months, I've been influenced by the poems of Rilke, Retka, and Lorca, among others. In the next poem, I'd like to imagine you'd imagine Garcia Lorca's, Lorca's ideas of duende, which is, duende is like a muse on steroids that lives apart with a dangerous, indifferent attitude. And think of that in relationship to Lorca's friend Salvador Dali's paintings. I like playing in the surreal to let the imagination go where it wants to go. This is a short poem called, She Felt the New Migration. One day, she woke up and said, all the fish have turned over in the sea. They migrate on a new gravity. And sure enough, when the fishermen cast their great nets, the nets rose like hot air balloons in a sky filled with bones that flapped their tails. This is from just a couple of days ago, so it's still a work in progress. It's called Neither This and Nameless. When we sleep in the clouds of thunder, but we live in the lightning of dreams, days slip by in a fog of reason. Night's silence hints at the unlikely sky. People cast furtive glances sideways seeing while the heart's desire slices through. Against the common backdrop, the dark facade, a lineage of a billion faces shine. Our empty stomachs rumble, but we hunger in our minds. The old ways die now, but in new ways a fission of renewal born at the core of stars. We but fuel for the future, and it demands all we are. Time unwinds us at the tip of a whip. Songs through our navels of the blessed dead, a record kept by night through our minds from our beds. Those who don't sleep wake for a reason. 
We get tired or bored or just restless. We pillow our frustration, confusing chaos with change. Small leaps of faith through hoops of chance, intent on dismantled happenstance. Insight spiked nonsense, a tide romance. Three square meals on empty plates, imagination starved for food for thought. A universe of the impossible in the beggar's palm, and a thirst for all at any cost. So this goes back to Lorca, like two, two poems left. So this goes back to Lorca and a character he, he wrote of called Amargo, which in Spanish means the bitter one. But it came out of an actual uh, memory that he had when he was a child of seeing an older child with a very large face looking through the window of his house and it really disturbed um, Lorca and he wrote about that. So I imagine that character, older, teens, early twenties, and what he might have been like in this small Spanish town, city. We shall name him Bitter Blaze. Amargo, on fire, his mind racing, slipping through a rope of alleys, limping in song past shadows. We call after him, Amargo. We whisper our endearment, yet its love is useless. He can't hear us. Amargo, swift as flames, love is not what he chases. It's the source of love he seeks just beyond his fingertips. Look how he reaches, thin arms extended through the parted veil of shimmered air, of bleeding light, where haloed crows, dark and beautiful, hover as a pledge of angels. They share their close-held songs as love, not born of man, but from the blood of sons. And he, with flooded eyes, is speared through all his separateness into a wailing joy. Amargo's heart stampedes wild on molten haunches. It towers without fear, without misgiving. His burning visions drive him, push him past our open doors. No tears stalk him. Our concerned glances go unnoticed. He runs, he runs, he runs through his street of dreams. In the spent nights, alone and careless, Amargo sleeps in abandoned factories where dreams were forged. He lays restless and hums against rusted machines. When we call to him across our shared darkness, he cannot hear us. His ears attend to the rarest voices of long lost stars. We are echoes to him when we ask, Amargo on fire, when will you wake and sing to us the conflagration of your heart? It's our relationships that sustain us on a daily basis. So I'd like to end with a love poem. In the light of ours, I have seen her in the light of every hour, each a shade of the girl she wears like a memory from childhood. I think I know her from another place, when she steps wet from bathing, and I see beneath her skin her timeless child. 
yet it is through her eyes she shows me beauty that knows no age. And by the lines about them point to wisdom and everything the years have cost her. In that gaze, so like remembering a dream, I hold my breath when she draws me close to a softer world than I have known. And with a kiss, she says to me, surely you remember this touch, this light, and all these hours of the day. Thank you very much.